Hi everyone, uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining tonight. I'd like to welcome you uh, on behalf of all of us from the lecture series. Just a really small housekeeping request in the first instance. If you can just kindly make sure that your microphones stay muted throughout the talk, that would be amazing. You can of course keep your cameras on if you wish. Uh, and just one last thing, if you have any question during the talk today, if you just put your question in the chat, we'll collate them all together and be able to ask them to our guests at the end of their presentation. A small introduction about us. Uh, the Design Academy Lecture Series is a talks program run by students. Whether in the form of a talk, debate, panel or a presentation, it's initially init it's initiated for DAE students, but now open to the public. By bringing together a diverse perspective, our goal is to create a space for critical debate and thinking in the field of design through all disciplines and positions. We seek to generate discussions relevant to how practices relate to current and ongoing societal discourses. And our leading topic for this year is collectiveness or the collective. It brings together various questions and opens up a conversation and questions around the role of design in processes, structures, and of course, how to design a collective from within. This, with this topic in mind, we're delighted to have Florian Mislin speaking with us today. Their research investigates how women's wear and men's wear remain two pre prevalent categories in the production of clothing. More specifically, they question how fashion photography seems to be an important site of negotiation to challenge such categories. With a strong focus on the analysis and generating of methodologies of practice, their work looks to develop visual and participatory research, participatory research methods to explore how photographers, art directors and fashion editors can queer the production of fashion photography or how they, can, they might refrain from doing so. Please give a warm welcome and thank you to Florian. Hi. <laughs> um, let me say first, yeah, first of all, of course, thank you for like big thank you for inviting me to the DA lecture series um, because I'm a quite fresh alumni from DAE from 2016. So it's really quite an honor to be presenting my practice with you all today. And then also thank you for everyone attending or streaming, if you're streaming this later on. I'll do the whole um, funny moment about sharing my screen, so just bear with me. Um, yeah, I think, are we already there? Is it like, let me put this here. You just see my slides. Yeah, cool. All right. So um, yeah. In the next 45 minutes, I'll very briefly reflect on how my practice has developed since I graduated. And then I'll talk um, about research methods and visual sociology, and finally explain a bit more about my project diagramming fluidity, which I've done in 2019. And then just for, yeah, very briefly mention how I'm continuing this project with the PhD that I'm now doing. Um, oh yeah, and we've got a link for a mirror board also, if you can put it on the chat. It's just if anyone wants to download the slides that I'm showing you, um, because some of them have references and maybe some of you are interested in looking at the references. Um, yeah, so just a bit about my background. Um, I started my studies with a technical degree in fashion design in Paris that I didn't really like for many reasons that I won't expand on now, but I did want to mention it because even if it's been um, a rather negative experience for me, I think it's worth underlining that this experience still shapes most of what I do and how I do it now today. Um, so then after this fashion degree, that's my slide, it's not going, um, I came here to do a BA in the department men and communication um, and I started developing a clear interest in visual culture and how we understand and experience our body through images especially in relation to gender and I graduated in 2016 with a visual analysis of unisex and gender fluid fashion campaigns from the year 2012 and 2015 
And this visual analysis looked at what is in the image as inside their frame. And I was exploring different, exploring different visual strategies that were used to convey um, that a clothing collection is neither women's wear or men's wear. So I was cutting those images into over hundreds of those diagrams or like infographics that you see here, not to study what is the best or most efficient way of communicating about gender fluid fashion, um, but more simply to study and demonstrate that there are many different ways of doing gender fluid fashion. Um, and you'll see later on how it's still there in my project. Um, so after graduation, I took a year off between my BA and MA. I was based in Eindhoven um, and started to do some workshops and continue developing my project on gender free fashion campaigns. So I went to Milan Design Week with Design Academy Eindhoven for the TV Clearity show, um, for which I had to make a performance. Um, and I contributed to the Fashion Class Festi Festival in Maastricht. And I was commissioned by Tent Gallery in Rotterdam. So all these different, like with all these different contributions, I was experimenting with different media, but actually I quite struggled to make something that felt to me that was grand grounded. Like I am not really proud of this project. Um, there were the steps I needed to take to explore what were any sources of enjoyment or curiosity, but also frustrations um, for me. So basically this project to me were not great, but they were very crucial in figuring things out. And um, as much as I felt I could work forever on this project about gender fluid fashion, I felt quite ill-equipped to continue it in a relevant way. Um, and I wanted to develop more research skills, but I also knew that I wanted to keep um, a creative practice. So when I look up for um, MA courses, I had a big crush on the MA visual sociology at Goldsmiths here in London, because it brought together sociological research and creative practice. So what is visual sociology? Um, maybe to start, what is sociology? So very briefly explain, like really briefly explain. <laughs> sociology is the study of the social world. Uh, it, so for instance, a sociological research might ask, what are the experiences of international students arriving in the Netherlands and how histories, institutions, laws shape these experiences? And visual sociology then is not necessarily the sociology of the visual, it's rather doing sociology through the visual, um, but also through the material, the emotional, the sensory. So for instance, we might make visual maps of immigration offices with international students to interview them about their experiences of these spaces. So that is working through images. And visual sociology is in some ways um, also informed by science and technology studies and many of the contemporary debates that challenge conventions and assumptions on how social sciences are done. So, so science and technology studies are also called STS and they've emerged in the 70s and 80s and they are studies of science. So it's a field studying the history of sciences and the technology they use to produce knowledge. Um, so understanding how social sciences are made or crafted and how their argument and evidence are fabricated, that all emphasize the central role um, methods play in the way we attend to social problem in the way we research them. So stuck again. Um, sorry, not yet. This raises questions on how assumptions that we might have about certain topics um, impact the way we study them. So for instance, regarding the topic of my own research, um, it's about acknowledging that binary understandings of gender or misogyny or Eurocentric perspective have influenced 
the way um, like have influenced what research is done about fashion, how it was done, and in fact, if it was done at all. Because fashion is seen as a super capitalist system and a feminized discipline, it's not always perceived as a relevant research topic. But fashion is an industry with exploitation of materials and human resources at the core of its manufacturing structure and creative labor. In France, just as an example, the five richest persons are all leaders of fashion industry corporations. So they're not from the oil industry, military, they're not from media or tech, they're leaders of the fashion industry. So when humanities and social sciences study um, or investigate fashion, it's to uncover how this system works and how it reinforces these inequalities. Um, so for instance, there's cultural theorist Angela, Angela McRobey, um, who published studies about the working conditions of, the, of creative labor in the fashion industry in 1998 and 2006, for which she coined the term passionate work, um, which is working for free in the hope of gaining visibility and credibility. Yet it is the hiring company which gets economic profit from your free or cheap labor. And more recently, uh, the social anthropologist Julia Mencitieri, who published in 2020 another study showing that uh, Macrobie's finding um, were still very much applying to today or an even worse as some of uh, yeah, the creative workers behind editorials in magazines like Vogue are still not remunerated or remunerated in free clothing, making them um, live precarious lives without covers for sickness or pregnancies, uh, maternity, um, accumulating jobs to get to the um, equivalent of a full-time income. So I'm sure you're all actually very familiar with this notion of passionate work or what it hides because it's very common in the design field too. Um, I've been there myself. Um, and another interesting study is the one of Alison Stokes from 2015 who investigated the communications around awards in fashion design and show these communications are drastically different when they cover information um, with designer that identify as men or as women. And she also highlights that most awards go to men, although women are the largest majority in the industry. So these three research projects I've just uh, mentioned use rather traditional forms of research method meaning their methodologies are mostly surveys, participant observations, ethnography, interviews, focus group. And that usually requires, or sorry, that usually relies quite heavily on text. Like surveys ask people to fill in questions or measure their experience in some ways. Mm -hmm. And interviews ask people to describe their experience mostly with words as well. But the kind of research I do, or the one uh, we develop in visual sociology at Goldsmiths, is practice-based research. So visual sociology asks, what do we miss when we study social worlds and social lives only based on text, words, or language? For instance, when someone transcribes an interview, do we describe somebody's um, language, body's lang sorry, somebody's body language in a transcript? Um, in that sense, also, can a transcript, an interview transcript, become a script for a performance? Or, in the case of my re in the case of my research, can an interview transcript become a manifesto or a mood board? How can the visual, emotional, sensory material um, take an active part in in the research and in the way we do research? And I think that these questions are major when we study gender, as it's crucial to bring attention to how embodied uh, personal and sensory experiences can interact, contradict, and or complicate the way gender has been institutionalized as a binary. So visual sociology is practice-based research, meaning the methods we work with 
the way we do interviews, investigate archives, analyze data, or shape outcomes is approached as a creative practice. Um, sociology, in a way, is about crafting stories of people's life. It involves a craft of producing and interpreting data. And so visual sociology is informed by the overlaps between sociological and artistic research methods to explore how research findings can be presented through materials other than um, scientific text, which, yeah, making then scientific research more public and engaging with more audiences. And that can include, for instance, audio recording, videos, installations, performance, workshops, and so on. Um, a major resource, resource for looking further um, into that is this book, which the cover is on the slides, called Live Method, edited by Les Back and Nirmal Kubar, who are staff here at Goldsmiths. So before I start explaining um, a bit more about my own project, I really want to just first maybe clarify a bit what I mean uh, with research here. So research is not a mode of action and, sorry, research is a mode of action and operation. It's not a discipline in itself. So people who do research in different disciplines have their own standard procedures, histories and objectives. Various disciplines may research the same problems, but each will do it differently. So for instance, sociologists might do research to understand how institutionalized system form citizenship inequalities. Um, biologists might do research to understand if oysters feel pain in the same way than human do. Designers might do research to understand how users interact with their prototype. Um, Facebook might do research to understand how it can make more profit with advertising content. So there's multiple ways of doing research and sharing these research findings. And research in social science, for instance, um, ends up mostly as text with loads of academic jar jargon in journals or books, which for most can only be accessed when you're affiliated to a, uni a university as a student or staff. And these journals are based on contributions from different authors who share their research finding um, from which future research can build on. Um, in contrast, I've been also working for a research agency that was doing research for big corporations like Facebook, Instagram, or Netflix. And this was privatized and commercial research, meaning it privatizes the knowledge being produced and uses this knowledge strictly towards profit and its own profit, obviously. So we would do months of research um, about, for instance, young girls' experiences of dating app with massive budgets, allowing us to be very quick in reaching participants and academic researchers. But our findings um, are bound to confidentiality contracts and will never be shared to the many researchers with much less fundings who work on the exact same problematic. So the knowledge being produced is only strictly shared with the client who is commissioning this research and then does not benefit the collectivity. Uh, probably because this knowledge um, will probably compromise the product and the reputation of the client. So um, with research method that expand beyond text, visual sociology challenges the accessibility of sociological research and its findings. The development of visual and sensory methods um, address questions such as how can findings from sociological research be shared and circulated beyond, beyond academic community? How can research process benefit the people and communities whose lives are directly concerned by the research? How can these communities be further involved in the research process as well to challenge this assumed hierarchy between the researcher and the participant? Um, so, for instance, the images you see here um, is from a great example of a participatory research project by Ben Barry on masculinity and fashion. Um, so it does not come from visual sociology uh, or sociology, but fashion studies, but it is a great example of how 
research finding can be shared through a fashion show, for instance. Um, so now, what is it that I am researching? So my research focuses on how um, fashion practices that don't conform to the women's wear and men's wear categories are negotiated within the fashion industry. And the fashion industry as we know it um, has developed um, across the 19th and 20th century and an integral part of this institutionalization in these centuries where the standardizations of sizes and the distinction then of menswear and women's wear. So you enter a closing store and you will have the sign saying women go this way and men goes the other way. Um, and with online shopping, you literally must press the button men or women before accessing the products. So gender divides fashion week calendars, the magazine shelves, the perfume packagings, everything come with an instruction of like, this is for men and this is for women. And gender conforming people, however, have always existed. And there's always been various styles and dressing practices in queer communities that don't conform to women's wear and men's wear. So what I'm addressing here is how this variety, variety of dressing practices remains invisible in the dominant fashion industry and um, which actively shapes, like it is an industry that actively shapes how we understand our bodies, our identities in our everyday life as we shop for clothing and as we scroll social media. And also it's quite clear that we've seen a popularization of gender fluid fashion within the industry over the last many decades. They rarely thrive and survive in the industry. And as is like, yeah, sorry. They rarely thrive and survive in the industry as established practices and brands. And they rather remain concealed in the women's wear and men's wear categories. So to me, there seems to be um, constant delegitimization of queer practices of fashion in the industry. And, um, and that's what I'm investigating in my research. Um, so for now, just clarifying, I'm using the terms gender fluid or gender non-conforming to mention fashion practices that are within and beyond women's wear and men's wear. There's quite a few different ways of using these terms. Um, there was also unisex, for instance, was used uh, for quite some decades. And there might be other ways of calling it now. Um, that is part of my ongoing research now. But with gender fluid and gender non-conforming terms, I don't mean a third unisex neutral category existing outside of the gender binary but I rather talk about practices that constantly work on transgressing binary assumptions of gender and sexuality. So that can still be a brand such as Palomo Spain that is registered as menswear, but challenges heteronormative notions of gender constantly. For instance, here we have Beyonce wearing a brand classified as menswear in her famous twin baby portrait. Um, because importantly also to register a brand as a company um, or attend shows or fairs, um, it is often required to have a specialism in women's wear or men's wear in uh, most countries also. And in fashion education, this gender specialism is also required in most uh, degrees. So I contributed to the platform Futures with an article for which I interviewed fashion graduates and educators about how curricula support students in developing practices beyond menswear and women's wear. Um, and so in the fashion school based in London, which are the ones I focused on for this article, keep reproducing this model of the fashion industry that we know very well is unsustainable, exploitative and excluding. And the anecdotes I, I got from those graduates um, really outline how this perspective challenging some of this glamorous canon of the fashion industry are still con considered optional in curricula, meaning that teaching to design for larger sizes, disabled bodies, 
gender neutral collections or addressing cultural appropriation is not part of the main classes, but options that students can orient themselves if they want to. And there are many, there are many educators working on challenging this. So I do want to refer to Ben Barry, Ruby Hoot, Tan Verhamed, Dino Bodicu, Otto van Busch or Hanka van der Voet, just to name a few. I just realized they didn't put their name on the slide. Um, but so one anecdote I collected in these interviews, for instance, is a um, student who worked on a gender fluid collection of shirts. In fashion atelier, you usually have the basic pattern template for a women's wear and a women's wear sh shirt. So those templates are, of course, based on assumptions of thin, abled and white bodies. And this student, however, wanted to work on a pattern that could be for any gender. So they described to me how they've worked for three months with the technicians to develop a gender fluid pattern. At the end of the interview, the graduate told me how they noticed that every year, more students want to do gender fluid collection. Yet the pattern that they developed as gender fluid is not stored in the atelier for those future students that want to work on gender fluid collection. So every year, new students will want to develop a fashion practice beyond women's wear and women's wear have to start from scratch, which makes gender fluid practice of fashion seem not only optional, but also exhausting and unpopular. So with my project, I investigate how such practices are constantly being restricted in the fashion industry and how fashion producers manage to overcome these restrictions to keep challenging how the industry shapes how we produce and consume fashion in relation to gender. I'll take a leap. So most importantly, um, my project focuses on the production of fashion photography. So I work on the production of images, not clothing. And I don't work either on what is on um, the images, which is what I did for my BA, but how these images are produced and what it takes to produce them. So I'm not interested in how queer practices of fashion look like, but what these practices do and what they demand to the industry that they are part of. And my focus on the production of images also highlights how editorials in fashion magazines and campaigns are used both for reinforcing certain norms, but also for challenging them because also images are the main tools for fashion corporations to co-opt and commodify marginalized fashion practices. So for example, um, the women's wear brand and other stories made this campaign in 2015 to respond to the increasing demand of more inclusivity in fashion. So they commissioned an all trans team, a trans men photographer, two trans women models and a trans stylist, hair and makeup artist. Yet seven years later, the brand still produces shoes doesn't produce its shoes above the size 42. So this shows that the images they produced were used as surfaces to look like change, um, but in fact hide what has not changed and what will not change. It gives the brand the status of fashion leader of the industry as they um, seem to respond to current debates, but images are what help them also keep this debate only at a surface level. And another example is the department store Selfridges in um, the UK that had a temporary space called A Gender. So this temporary department was selling clothing from gender free brands and um, the department was open for two months. So from March to April 2015 which, you know, two months is not even a fashion season. And since then, Selfridges does not have a space where products are available without a gendered label. So again, this temporary, temporary gender fluid department was coming with images of campaigns and lookbooks that still circulate online, 
um, associating the branch self ridges with the debate, but no actual changes to their structure happened since then, since it's actually lasted two months. Um, so yeah, that is what I'm researching. Um, now I'll tell you a bit more about the project diagramming fluidity, which I've done for my MA in 2019. So it's a bit more focusing on the method I was developing for that. So the story of diagramming fluidity starts with good timing. Uh, before I started my second year of the MA, um, two curators from Philadelphia Museum of Art, Art Institute of Chicago and Walker Art Center in Minneapolis in the US got in touch with me about my BA project for an exhibition um, called Designs for Different Futures. And when they got in touch, I told them that I was about to start a new version of my BA project, but with a longer process, which was one year and a new perspective, which was visual sociology. And we've had a few phone calls and meetings until we settled on the idea of hanging out four poster in the, in the exhibition about eight months before I even graduate. So I developed a um, visual and participatory method called diagrammatic manifestos for this project, which consists of co-editing a manifesto based on interviews with each participant of the research about their practice of fashion photography. So I interviewed eight fashion producers, all based in London. There was the um, director of Verve, a gender fluid fashion retailer in East London, um, fashion photographers, Henry Tiart, Nicole Engay, and Vic Lantain, um, Tanme Saxena as well, the founder, director, and designer of uh, unisex, brand Lane 45, who produce clothing on demand here in Acne, London, and Saola Houston, who worked as a photographic editor and producer at Dazed Beauty, and then two anonymous participants, uh, one who is a stylist and fashion editor and one who is a photographer as well. So I did between one to three interviews um, with each of them. And my aim with developing this research method was to avoid making a generalization of gender fluid practices of fashion and instead highlight how everyone does it differently. That's why we ended up with one manifesto for each because gender fluid fashion is not a style, it's not a trend, it's not an aesthetic, but it's various and nuanced ways of producing fashion whilst transgressing the standard standardization of fashion production. So the project also, in a way, questions how research methods can also themselves perpetuate normative enunciations of gender in sociology. So the visual and participatory aspect of it um, works towards accommodating more complex and ambivalent account of gender and allowing more agency to the participants in formulating their own contribution. I'll explain more about the method in a second so that this all makes sense actually. But so for this method, I've been using diagrams to transcribe interviews, analyze these this transcripts, generate new interview questions, allow the participants to intervene in my interpretation of their descriptions and share the research uh, findings in an exhibition and beyond. So now I'll do a step-by-step -step description of the method and have a zip first. So in the first interview, um, we were just discussing the usual process they go through when they take part um, in the production of an editorial or a campaign as a photographer, stylist, or art director. And then I would transcribe the interview um, which is usually done in a chronologi chronological order. So usually interview transcription starts from minute one to minute 45, but I directly transcribe the interview by mapping connections between the different topics being discussed. And this allowed, for instance, to directly notice visually what topics seem to be important and a priority for the interviewee and how this was different for each participants. 
because each of them told their story very differently. So for instance, with the three photographers, one mostly spoke about their relation to the model, another about the importance of the team they work with, and another with how subcultural references feed their practice on the mood boards. And the diagrams, because they shape the data, allow a working through difference rather than similarity. So I looked more at how they were all saying things differently rather than what were they saying the same. I made plenty of these diagrams as I was moving um, each part of the transcript and exploring how they connect to each other. And by doing so, I was also drafting my next questions for the second interview. And so for the second interview, um, I had an A3 paper version of this diagram with some pens for me and the participant to annotate the visual map, as you see on the, on the Zoom there. And we were pointing at the diagrams to discuss different topics and how they relate to each other while we had this discussion. We'd question my interpretation also of the first interview, agree on some things and reformulate others. And so I transcribed the second interview on top of this diagram, um, looking at what part of the diagram would maybe expand or reduce, which one would change. Um, maybe some of the parts of the diagrams would be erased because they uh, didn't seem um, so important anymore. And so in a sense, the diagrams allow a fluid visual mapping constantly in motion where the craft of sociological research is made visible, accessible and participatory. And this format also aimed to challenge my own position as a so-called academic expert and the one of the participant also as subject of my research because actually um, it's rather the opposite. They are the experts in their field and I want to learn about it and make sure that they can identify themselves in the account um, I make of their practice through my research. So once the interviews were done, um, so we've done that twice with a few, three times with one um, of the participants. Once the interview were done, each of them provided me with one image of their portfolio to include on the poster and I edited the final text for the manifestos. And these texts um, are not quotes from the interviews. They are sentences based on the interviews that also merged uh, the participant words, their tones um, with my own words and the ones also of the literature that informed my research. And so the text was approved also by each participant before I was sending it to the museum. So just a few words on the final kind of designs as well um, of the posters. So the project was very much informed by the text, here it is, <laughs> the text um, Cruising Utopia, the there and then of queer futurity by Jose Esteban Munoz. I wanted the visual design of the poster to refer to his description of utopia not being prescriptive but rather rendering potential blueprints of a world not quite here, a horizon of possibility, not a fixed scheme. So the design of the manifesto remains sketchy, like, like a work in progress, um, to contradict ideas of research as stable knowledge and practices of gender fluid fashion as established. So all the diagrams um, I have made for each participant are layered in the background of their manifesto. And on top is a la large text, which I copied and zoom in and out a few times with a photocopy machine, um, which refer to this mutual rephrasing that happened in the research method. And a, a secondary reason is also that at the time, I was a, a sociology student, so I did not have access to workshops and I wanted to make a bit of a point out of it. So um, how to have a creative practice with the photocopy of the library, obsessively zooming in and out of the words and copying them. Um, and so, yeah, in the exhibition designed for different futures, we simply hang out the posters as was planned with the commission. 
And the manifestos were also exhibited more recently at Le Cine, the National Center for Graphic Design in France between May and November 2021. So there, each of the diagrams um, made was printed in a single A4 onto which the larger manifestos were printed over, making visible the transcript and so the data that, I was, that was used for editing the manifestos. And from this project, I also published a paper in the peer-reviewed academic journal uh, Fashion Studies in November 2020. This article is open access online, um, which much, most academic journals don't do. So you have the URL just down there. And I've published a longer essay with Onomatope here in Eindhoven. Uh, we launched the book in October 2020, which is um, FYI <laughs> sold out now, but they're printing a second edition um, for spring. And of course, there are limitations to these methods. Um, so the format of the manifesto suggests quite a strong statement to mobilize collective potential but it is a format that sometimes felt inappropriate when I realized that the participatory method come with some difficulties um, and limitations such as the one of time, for instance, I couldn't require a participant to spend a lot of time on the research to co-edit this text and also the limitation of engagement in a way. So it's been challenging to have participants really actively draw on my diagrams, question them, review my text as I wanted them to really question it. Um, so in the end, it is mostly me that edited the, their manifestos and the eight manifestos also look relatively the same as you can see, uh, with my own aesthetic taking over some of the participants, um, taking over the participants one, whilst I could have included a bit more their style by just for instance, letting them choose a font or a background color. But so these limitations, they're always important to simply acknowledge and reflect on, um, especially now that I'm continuing the project. So that's also why now I'm continuing the project with a focus on the format of the mood board. So I'm doing this PhD part time, which means it's going to take years. Um, and it's still in the department of um, sociology, where I did my MA at Goldsmiths. And my research question is kind of the same, although um, further developed. And I now also focus on mood boards. So the mood boards is both a subject research of research and a method. So um, because it is a tool that nearly every creative in the fashion industry uses, I'm now exploring how this device of the mood board can be mobilized as a visual and participatory research method, which, you know, in the way various materials can be brought in on this mood board and discussed, move around, manipulated, and how we can accumulate them as well. And also mood boards demand less of a big statement compared to the manifestos. Um, they can be better approached as an investigative work in process as well. Maybe they seem less fancy than diagrams. Um, they're also more visual and collaborative in practice compared to the diagrams. So this project is anyway very, very much of a, at an early stage still. So I'm um, quite looking forward to share more with you later on. Um, so we're getting close to the end. Uh, but before finishing, I just wanted to mention two last things. So how might practice take shapes beyond this project? So uh, yeah, and then also just some last words on the time it takes to develop a practice. So first, I would say that my practice now is about developing visual and participatory methodologies. So whether that is for research, but also public workshops and classrooms. So for instance, I did these um, workshops at Palais de Tokyo in Paris, where we made fashion fanzines informed by quotes from queer theory. I also did an online workshop with Femke de Vries, who is an artist and researcher based in Amsterdam, and the collective Practice Matter, which I'm a part of, um, which is from the sociology department at Goldsmiths. Um, so we wanted to explore, for instance, how collage with fashion magazines can be a sociological research method in itself. 
and I do workshops about mood boards and gender with fashion students at Goldsmiths. And I do also workshops here at Design Academy with geo design students about research methods. And uh, previously also I did this one at London College of Communication where I now work. Uh, yeah, so this is a page with further resources, but before I get to that, I do just want to like, I don't know, I had some tips and tricks <laughs> as, a, as an alumni, but just wanted to reflect that sometimes nothing happens for many and very long months, but then you just keep going and keep reading and making, documenting, sharing, engaging with people around you. And after a while, exist like opportunities will show up. So it's like um, very slow and random gardening. You plant many seeds, you keep watering them, and uh, some of them will grow in four months, and some of them will grow in three years. And some of these opportunities might not be paid. I've uh, worked myself as a dishwasher, waitress, and a barista until last. January 2021, so it's just over a year. Um, and in the meantime, I was working on those projects. And most of the time I was working on too many projects at the same time, so very bad for my mental health. But this project I got in touch, yeah, but it's through this project that got me in touch with so many people that inspire me and also keep reminding me of what I want to do and why I must do it. And these people are kind of on that page here. So this was, for instance, um, working with Modus, who is a platform for expanded fashion practices that connects a network of practitioners working beyond the glamorous canon of the fashion industry. So if anyone listening to that is having a fashion practice, do check the second link, Modus Onomatopoeia.net. Um, and also engaging with the amazing community of futurists who have a fellowship, extra, extracurricular programs, and contributors uh, from all over the world discussing design politics. Um, that is an important resource to be checking. And then all the other ones that you can check um, as well. So yeah, this was my monologue. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah. For uh, yeah, uh, your presentation and everything. Uh, there's a tradition within the lecture series where everyone uh, that's watching, if they're happy to, and their camera's off, comes back on. So we can kind of give a applause. <laughs> yeah, you can do either, depending on what you want, but just to say a big thank you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Good luck Thanks. with the PhD. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining me as well. And yeah, we'll see you Thanks soon. Thanks for inviting again. Bye. Bye. Good evening, everyone. Bye bye.